Amen. Lord, we just thank you for your word as we just, uh, Lord, we love the word of God. Lord, we love your word and we just thank you for it, Lord. It's, uh, Lord, it's life to us, Lord Jesus. And Lord, as we just come be, before it and just, um, just to get an understanding of your grace, we just want to thank you, Lord God, for the cross. Thank you for giving us communion, Lord, that we can remember what you've done for us and your love for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, as you know, we've been doing the series Golden Thread of Grace. We'll just um, put that aside and we're do, doing some messages on grace and, and destiny. And just going to do a, just three parts on a story that I love, a story of a guy called Mephibosheth. And um, so we'll be recording that if you, if you don't get to see the other ones and you can have a look at them. But it's a beautiful p- picture of the love and grace and mercy of God. So let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 9. And verses 1 to 5. Great to have Bruce and Val here. (laughs) They're the reason why you get shade under the house on a (laughs) Sunday (laughs) afternoon. I said to someone uh, that Bruce helped me build the house. It's actually not true. I helped him build the house. (laughs) Get that in perspective. (laughs) So 2 Samuel chapter 9 and verses... Uh, and, and, of course, we couldn't have done it without the scones for morning tea either, Val, so <laughs> that was so much. Okay, let's just read this from uh, 2 Samuel 9, verses 1 to 5. Now, David said, Is there still anyone who is left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? I'm going to read that again and come back to that. He said, Is there still anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant in the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And so they called him to David, the king, and said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, Yes, at your service. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Well, indeed, he is in the house of Machai, which is the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. And then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Machai, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. So when we start to unpack this in verse 1, it's interesting because it says, David saying, Is there anyone left in the house of Saul? that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake. Because David made a covenant with Jonathan, and we're going to see that in a moment. But, you know, it's a picture of the father and the son. And, you know, I believe that God is still saying today, is there anyone on the earth that I can show kindness to for Jesus' sake? Is there a nation? Is there a city, a neighborhood, a family? You know, is there someone in this church that I can show kindness for Jesus' sake? Amen? And the kindness and the blessing and the favour that we get from God is all because of Jesus' sake. Amen? Hallelujah. It's not, God never made a covenant with me. God never made a covenant with you. He made a covenant with his son. And we're grafted into that covenant. Just like this, this boy, Mephibosheth, he was a, a son of Jonathan. And because he was a son, he actually was entitled to the covenant, which was the blessing that was a covenant that wasn't even made with him. It was made between David and Jonathan. And all the blessings that we receive today is because Jesus made a covenant with his son that, he, you know, that God so loved the world that he'd sent his only son that whoever would believe on him would, would not perish but have eternal life. And, you know, I, the thing is, is that the blessing of God actually is not just for those who've accepted him, but, you know, when we, we're about to have this season of Christmas, and what did the angel say to the shepherds? He said, goodwill and peace to all men. <laughs> not just to Christians, not to those who believe, to all men. The Bible says that the sun rises and shines on the righteous and the unrighteous. Amen. And so... The blessing of God is on this earth because of the covenant that was made with Jesus. And my Bible says to me, it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. You know, even when we're doing the wrong thing, you know, but the Bible says, while we were enemies with Christ, 
He came and laid down his life for us. And when we understand the, the, the grace and the favour of God, it actually warms our hearts and wants us to serve him and to love him and accept him as Lord and Saviour. And so let's just go back into 1 Samuel 18 just to lay down a little bit of um, backstory. And uh, 1 Samuel 18, 1 to 4 says, Now when he finished speaking to Saul... And um, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. So Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off his robe and that was, um, and that was on him and gave it to David and his armour, even the sword and his bow and his belt. So that day... They made a covenant with each other that they would bless, they would be a blessing to each other and that blessing would go into each other's household. And you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a picture of the covenant that was made between the father and the son. You know, the name Jonathan means the Lord's gift. Amen. Jesus was a gift from God. Amen. He was his beloved son, the gift that came. And the word John means God's gracious gift. And David means beloved. So all in that covenant was that God would send a gift of grace because he so loved the world. Amen? He would send his beloved son because he so loved the world. And we see in verse 1 it says that the soul of Jonathan and David were knit together. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen? They were knit together. They were one. And Jesus was the um, expression of the Father. And then it also says in verses 1 and 3 that Jonathan loved him as his own soul. The love of the Father for the Son and the Son for the Father. We see that through Scripture all the time, that there was a love towards the Father and that there was a, um, a love from the Father to the Son. In fact, when Jesus came on this earth, you know, the, the Jews saw God as a judgmental God, as a, as a, a boss. In fact, there's, there's two words for Lord. There's, um, there's Yahweh, which is when you read it in the, in the Old Testament, it's capitals L-O-R-D. But whenever you read capital L and then lowercase O-R-D, that's actually the word Adonai. And Adonai means master or boss. Interesting enough, the word Yahweh, which is the covenant-keeping God, there are so many more of those scriptures, I've, I've kept, but it's some, well over like three, three times more than master or boss, yet their relationship with God, they saw him as a master or boss. And when Jesus came, he came to show God as a loving father. Amen? The only time he actually called him God was when he was on the cross. He said, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? And he was quoting scripture from Psalm. So he came to show that God is a, a, a loving father. It's interesting because, you know, we, we um, sometimes um, think of God would do things that our own fathers wouldn't do. And so, you know, there's a scripture that says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delights in his way. Though he falls, he is not cast, cast down. The Lord upholds him in his hand. Yet so many people see God as a judgmental God. And if, if you fall, that he's, he's going to put his foot down and keep you there, you know, and make you learn a lesson. But even a father will come along. I remember when I was teaching my son to, to ride a bike. And I would run, run along behind him and hold it up and then I'd let him go and he'd fall and then I wouldn't go, well, that's it. Don't you ever ride that bike again. Don't even try again. You, you know, you're useless. That's never going to work. Yet we see God like that, you know, that God's just like um, doing that. But yet us, you know, we would actually pick him up and put him back on the bike and have another go. <laughs> and funny enough, uh, when we were living in New Zealand, um, my wife at the time said, um, I'll, I'll do what your dad does and I'll, and I'll um, help you. And, and my son said, no, no, don't. And she said, no, it's fine. And so she let him go at the top of the hill and he crashed into the garage door. <laughs> she didn't know that I was actually running behind him, holding him, holding him up and um, probably being his trainer wheels. So David tried to warn her, but anyway, she didn't realise. But that's, you know, um, God is like a dad who takes their kids swimming and then, you know, 
do you remember those days when, when Dad used to take you down to the pool and he'd put his hand under your belly and you'd think you're swimming, but if he moved your hand, you'd sink like a brick? <laughs> you know, that's, that's how God, he loves us and, and does that for us. So verse 4 of that, back in um, 1 Samuel 18 says, David could not, now he, he gave him his armour, but the interesting thing, David could not wear Saul's armor. Do you remember when? Do you remember when he went to fight Goliath and Saul said, "Take my armor." He couldn't wear it. He tried to put it on and he couldn't wear it. David could not wear Saul's armor, but he could wear Jonathan's armor. He couldn't wear the armor of man, but he was. But he wore the armor of the covenant. He was robed in righteousness, honor, power, glory, majesty was given unto Jesus, the highest honor. So God made a covenant with Jesus, but he never made a covenant with you. Jesus fulfilled the terms and conditions of that covenant, and the price was paid on the cross when he said, it is finished. Amen? The price was paid. Now, um, our part is to believe and receive. You know, this is where people get this wrong as well. They think, okay, my part is, you know, what I have to do for God, and then he'll do for me. And that's part of the covenant. No, you know, that was covenant. That's what happened with, with Jonathan and David. They made a covenant that they would do certain things for each other. But God never asked that of us. Yeah, we're under the Abrahamic covenant, Abraham. And remember when he made a covenant with Abraham, he put Abraham to sleep so he couldn't actually reciprocate. And then God said, this is what I'm going to do for you. This is what I'm going to do for your nation. In 400 years, they'll come back, and this is what I'm actually going to do. And so God made a covenant with his son. And all we need to do is believe it and receive it. Amen? To walk in it in faith, to believe that it is finished, it's been done by Jesus Christ, and walk in it. And now the Bible says every spiritual blessing is ours through Christ Jesus. Amen? Ephesians 1, 3. So the question is, we don't ask the question, am I acceptable before God? Don't ask the question, am I worthy to receive his blessing? They're the wrong questions. Ask, is Jesus acceptable before the Father? Is Jesus worthy to receive every blessing? Amen? Because I'll ask you the question, is Jesus worthy to receive every blessing? Is Jesus acceptable before the Father? Well, the Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. Amen? So our acceptability before God, our relationship before God, all comes from the covenant that was made between Jesus and the Father. That's the question we need to ask. So many people are saying, well, Martin Luther, he actually had that question. How can man relate to a holy God? How can a man stand before a holy God? And then he understood that the righteous shall, the just shall live by faith. Amen? We're justified, we're righteous in the sight of God, we can have a relationship with God because of what Jesus did on the cross. Amen? And because he is acceptable, because the receipt was paid when he died on the cross, when he rose again, then we know that we are acceptable before him. Hallelujah. Amen. So what was the result of the covenant that was made between Jonathan and David? So let's go to 1 Samuel 20. And verses 14 to 17. So this is what the covenant they made between each other. They said, And and you shall not only show me the kindness of the Lord while I'm alive, I may not die, but you shall not cut off your kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord has cut off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord require it at the hand of David's enemies. Now Jonathan again caused David to vow because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. So what he was saying is that you will... They made a covenant with each other that they will show kindness to each other, but that would not only to them, but it would actually um, go on to their offspring. Amen? And um, John 1.12 says, But as many as has received him, to them he gave him the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. Amen? And so when we are grafted in, when we become the children of God, we're receiving the blessing that was actually made through that covenant. So when we go back to um, 2 Samuel 9, 1, and um, both Jonathan and, and Saul have died in battle, 
And um, David is actually starting to ask the question now. He wants to continue to fulfill the covenant that he actually made with Jonathan. So he starts to ask the question, is there anyone still in the house of Jonathan that I may bless because of the covenant that I actually made with, with uh, Jonathan? And they found that there was one person left. It was Jonathan's grandson, a guy called Mephibosheth, and he was lame in his feet. And the, the Bible describes what happened in two, how he got lame in 2 Samuel 4. And Mephibosheth was about five years old when Saul and, and Jonathan died in battle. And so when the news that Saul and Jonathan had died in battle, Mephibosheth's nurse took him and fled. And the reason she did that is because traditionally what would happen is that if a new king came in and they weren't part of the family, they would kill off everyone from the other family so they didn't have any trouble. And so actually there was, if you read the account, there was um, Mephibosheth had a brother called, I think it was um, Eshibopheth, and some of David's men went and killed him because they knew that's, without knowing the covenant, they knew that's what you do. You know, you don't, you don't mess around. It's not like in our politics that those who are being usurped are still in the cabinet and they're still stirring trouble. No, they didn't do that in those days. I think even in some kingdoms now they still do that. They wipe out the whole family so there's no trouble to come from the previous family. And so they all knew that, but they didn't know the covenant that was made between David and Jonathan. And so David's asking, is there anyone left, you know, and um, now when the nurse who was nursing this five-year-old child heard that, that, that Jonathan and Saul had been killed, she fled to, to protect him because that's all she knew. All she knew is that David was going to come after him and kill him because that's what kings did. Okay? So what happened is that um, uh, when she fled, she actually dropped him and it crippled him. So it says, Mephibosheth ran in fear of David, in, and in her haste she fell, and he became lame. He didn't know about the covenant. They ran in fear. He was crippled by fear. He was running, and in running he became lame. And how, how many people don't understand the love and the covenant that God has made with Jesus, and they're crippled by fear when it comes to God? And they're spending their whole life running away from the very person who actually wants to bless them. And so in a, in what they do is they become lame. <laughs> they may not become physically lame, but they become spiritually lame because they're running away from the very person who actually sent his only son to actually save them so that he can bless them. Amen? I mean, it, it says in um, Ephesians uh, chapter 2 that we were all doing our own thing, running our own course, we were dead in our trespasses, but God, because of his grace and mercy, reached out to us, by grace we're saved. And so people are running and, you know, they've got all the excuses and they've made all the reasons why there isn't a God or they've, they've looked at the Old Testament and said, you know, he's just a mean God. Do you know, Brenda was talking about the passion and she said she can't see that movie just because, um, you know, be, be just she can't see that sort of um, graphic nature. I went and saw that movie and I came out of that movie with an overwhelming sense of God's love, that Jesus would go to that extent for me. But you know, I know somebody else who went to that movie and thought God must be a mean God that he'd let his son do that. And that's how he's, that was the filter of which he was seeing God. He wasn't understanding the love that it took, that, that God so loved the world, that, that it was such amazing love that Jesus would do that. And so people, people are are blinded, they're lame by the fact that they're running from a God who they have a wrong concept of, thinking that he's just out to get them. Did anyone see the movie Bruce Almighty? J um, it was Jim Carrey. Anyone ever seen that movie? Okay. There's a part in that movie where, you know, um, you know he, he's, he's running and, and, and God keeps showing signs and he's ignoring it. And, um, you know, God turns up and Anyway, he says, you know, this is what God's like. God is like 
uh, uh, I'm like an ant on an anthill, and God's like a boy with a magnifying glass trying to frizzle my my um, you know, feelers off and fry me. He said, that's what God is like. Do you know how many people think that's what God is like? And so they're running from God, and the very God keeps turning up and turns up, and Christians are like, oh, no, I don't want to know anything about them, and, you know, and on it goes. And they're lame because, as we know and as we've seen through um, the last lot of messages, is that God has a plan and purpose for your life. He actually destined you for an amazing plan and purpose. And when we actually come in line with that and understand that he loves us and he has a plan and purpose for our lives, we actually realize, hey, and the extent that he sent his son so that he could actually bless me. Amen? Yeah, people are running, you know, giving all the excuses and saying, you know, oh, there is no God, running from the very person who actually wants to love them and bless them. Amen? And so that, that's a picture of that is that because this lady didn't know, because she didn't know about this covenant, she's running for his life, take, taking this boy, thinking he's going to be killed by, from, by the very person who actually wants to bless him. Isn't that amazing? And so this Mephibosheth, his actually destiny was to be a prince and a king next in line to the throne. In fact, the name Mephibosheth means exterminating the idol or contender against Baal. Isn't that interesting? You know, when we read through the Old Testament, we see kings. There were kings that were good kings and, and they would tear down the Baals and they would tear, tear down the idol worship and they would re restore, you know, worship to God. And then there were other kings who'd tear all that down and bring Israel into idol worship. And so Mephibosheth's destiny his actual name means an exterminator of idols and contender against Baal. He was actually meant to be a godly king who was going to rule and reign and actually, you know, and, and promote God. Yet this lady thinks he's going to be killed and so she's, she's running and drops him and he gets lame. And so here he was, lame, useless, fearful, running and hiding. David didn't even know he existed. He was living in lack, running from God. He was living in, in the house of Machi, not even in his own house. He's a guy who was meant to be a prince and a king, not even living in his own house. He was living in a place called Lodabar. Lodabar means no pasture, barren. <laughs> Yet here's David writing songs about he makes me to lie in green pastures. You know, how much is that a picture of people, even not even just people who aren't saved, but Christians who have this understanding of God that he's a vengeful God and he's just out to get them. They're constantly running and they're living in a place where they're not living according to their destiny. They're not living according to all the blessings from God because they have a wrong understanding of God. You know, if I... Um, I've got a $50 note in, in here in my pocket. If I crunch that up, into a ball, how much is that worth? $50. If I put that on the ground and stamp on it and tread on it, how much is it worth? See, it doesn't change its value. No matter what happens to this note, it actually doesn't change its value. And that's the thing with God. We can, go, we can be crushed. We can be broken. We can go through all sorts of things. But it does not change the value that God places on us. Amen? And when we come to that understanding, we come to the understanding that God made a covenant with his son and that we didn't even do anything to actually, you know, to earn it, to buy into it. All we did is believed in what Jesus Christ did for us. And then we continue to believe that in faith. And then God says, you have value and you have purpose. There's a purpose for which this $50 note is going to be spent. I'm yet to know what that's going to be. You know, I will probably find out in, in a few days. But... But it has a purpose. You know, it has value. And no matter what I do to that, the value doesn't change. You know, I can crush it, I can break it, I can, I can stick it in the mud. It's still got the same value. Somebody else might see it, clean it up, and then they've got $50, okay? I could go, it's, it's muddy, it's dirty, it's crushed, it's of no value. The value never changes. And God has a value on you. He values you. He loves you. He trusts you. He trusts you enough to put his Holy Spirit inside of you. And so 
here Jesus is saying, is there anyone I can show, God is saying, is there anyone I can show kindness that I can bless for Jesus' sake? Jesus went, you know, it, it, it was, took, went great lengths for Jesus to do what he, you know, left, left heaven. You know, we, we talk about when he died on the cross, but what about when he came into, um, you know, just a little child? And so he w- was actually dependent on a teenage mother to actually raise him. Yeah, he was restricted into a, you know, God could have actually sent his son and um, appeared on this earth when he was a teenager or appeared on this earth when he was 30 and just start from there. But no, he actually chose him to be, to be birthed the same way that we are, to live a life like we did and to understand who we are because he wanted to bless us and, um, and enjoy for us to enjoy that relationship with him. And then I'll just finish on this. We all know this scripture is probably the, the most quoted scripture in all the Bible. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. You know, and I believe, I know you guys know a lot of the stuff that I'm preaching today, but I believe this is a message that we just have to get out to everybody. You know, when it comes to gossiping the gospel, people need to know that there's a God who loves them, who cares for them, who, who they have value. You know, so many people in this world don't believe they have any value. They've got nothing to contribute. You know, they're just, you know, a blob on a log. And, you know, like even uh, you know, evolution tells us that we were monkeys and that we were just a cell. No, we were, you know, wonderfully created for a purpose that God has for us, and everybody is in that in in that um, in that boat. And you know, they might have been ripped off in their lives, and and they might have been crushed and broken, but their value has never changed. They're valued enough that Jesus Christ came and died for them. And so, I just want to um, encourage you guys, just just to get that out there and just share the love of God. You know, I've, I've got a, just, just one thing. I, um, I was a little bit disturbed um, this week when um, I saw a, um, a very prominent um, person saying that the fires that are happening in Australia is the judgment of God. I was very, very disheartened about that because I know that's not true. <laughs> you know, because, and I was talking to somebody about it and they was well, you know, what about in Matthew, it says wars and rumours of wars and all that. I said, that's not the judgment of God. That's Jesus saying, they're the things that are going to happen. Actually, if you look at most of those things, they are caused by man. You know, wars are caused by man. Even, even um, famine is, is caused by man. There's a lot of things that are actually caused by man. It is not God judging the earth. The Bible says there will be a day of judgment. Amen? But, you know, John 3.17 says, well, 3.16, so God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. And 17 says, I did not come into the world to condemn or to judge the world, but that the world through me might might be saved. Do you think a message? Do you think a message in uh, Australia that oh, you know, those people that are dying and those people who have left the farms—that's the judgment of God. Do you think people are going to respond to that? You know, they're going to. One lady on the news said that, that he's making God out to be a monster. You know, what 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 I find, um, and we've seen that we've seen it with the floods here, is that when there are disasters. You know, there's an amazing supernatural love of God and the people of God that just reach out to help people. And we can't explain everything that happens. But look, we live in a place where there are bushfires. If you live here where we live, it's going to (laughs) flood because the river rises and the river falls. Amen? It's going to happen. We choose to live in those areas and we live in a country, a sunburnt country, and things happen. But the thing is, is that praise God for the firefighters and praise God for those, those guys who you know, protecting their own house and then going after others. They're, they're the people we should be championing. And, and um, there's a disaster relief network where um, chaplains will go into those areas and will just help people. And we were able to be a part of that here. Imagine if when the floods came that we said, well, that's the judgment of God. Imagine how we, that would have been seen. But we know that's not the truth because God says there will be a day of judgment. Amen? But up, uh, now, here's the thing. Jesus Christ 
took the judgment of God when he died on the cross. Amen? The wrath and the judgment of God for for all our sins, for our present sins and future sins was taken on Jesus. That's why he said, it is finished. He has completed it. He has taken that judgment. Now he's able to administer righteousness and blessing and actually see people come into a loving relationship with God. Amen? And so, you know, unfortunately there are still people out there that are, that are preaching an Old Testament God or preaching a, a, a God of judgment, of fear, and um, we, we need to be able to go out there and let people know that's not what the Word of God says. Amen? The Word of God is about a God. If you want to know, if you want to know the char- characteristics of God, just turn to 1 Corinthians 13 because it says love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not remember wrongs. And my Bible says God is love. Amen? And so if you, let's just finish on that. Um, And let's replace, I'm going to replace every word that says love with the word God, because that is the the true attributes of God. And so um, we'll finish on that. 1 Corinthians 13. You know, the joy that I have is that most weddings that I do here and, and they're non-Christians, I share this, but I share pe- with people. That's the, the nature of God. And so let's start with um, verse 4, and I'm going to replace the word with love with God. So God suffers long and is kind. God does not envy. God does not parade himself. He is not puffed up. God does not behave rudely, does not seek its own. He is not provoked and thinks no evil. He does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. God bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and God never fails. Amen? That is who our God is, and that's who we need to let this world know. So, Lord, we just thank you for today, for today, Lord God. We thank you for this beautiful covenant relationship that was made by you and your son, Lord, and that, Lord, we are privileged to, to come into that as children, just like Mephibosheth was a child of the covenant, not even knowing about the covenant until David rocks up and says, is there someone in this house who I can bless? And I just thank you today, Lord God, that you want to bless people, that you want to love people, that you want to um, help people in the destiny and plan and purpose that they, you have for their life, all because of your son, Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.